first say how honored and humbled I am that uh, I am here and to share some words about a horrific experience <coughs> that we've tried to re envision how it might become uh, in the last analysis a transition of tragedy into triumph. I, uh, I understand that you are beginning a series of discussions on truth and reconciliation uh, and I'm very, very pleased to hear that in a discussion that we had with Bishop Tutu, he raised the question, uh, do you think that truth processes will catch on in the United States? And um, who was I to answer that question? <laughs> uh, but I said to him that if we can keep this process authentic, if we can keep it from becoming co-opted, if we focus hard on the hard work of digging out the truth in the spirit of compassion, I think that it has a chance. And he said that without something like that, I can't quite envision the future of your country. So I'm very happy to hear that uh, a prestigious university like this is engaging in this discussion. I bring you greetings from the beloved Community Center of Greensboro, and um, perhaps in the question and answer, we can say some words about that. But I want to say now that what grounds us is our view that we humans have so much in common that we've not yet come to appreciate and realize. And therefore, we stand for the dignity and the worth and the enormous unrealized potential of everyone. And that's kind of an anchoring approach to all of our work. I also bring you greetings from the Elder Council. Uh, you have to be 65 to get in this club. <laughs> and we formed, uh, you might recognize James Lawson, uh, Vincent Harding, um, Bernice Reagan Johnson, and partly because of the work done around truth and reconciliation, they chose to have the founding conference in Greensboro. I want to say that I'm doubly honored to be here tonight because I get to see such cherished and uh, long-time friends, including Sally and Paul Barmasan and Marty Nathan. Um, allow me to just wonder a little bit here in the beginning. Um, Paul was shot in the head in Greensboro, and he sustained a lifelong injury. And Sally, his, his lovely wife, had to persevere in the struggle with an injured husband and with a little child. And so I want to say to Paul and Sally that uh, I am very proud of how you stood against all the contrary winds and became a beacon for justice and truth. And uh, people need to know a little more about the people who did that. And let me just say that I can't say enough uh, about Marty Nathan, who lost her husband on that bloody day. Uh, Marty took the money from the insurance, and most of it, she invested it in the Greensboro Justice Fund. And the Greensboro Justice Fund funded uh, struggling processes throughout the South. And she stayed on that for over 20 years. And I want to say to you tonight that without that work, there would be no Greensboro 
truth and reconciliation process. So if you will allow me, I would like to invite them to stand and invite you to give them a round of applause. I want to report to you that it went quite well. And on somewhat on the side note, I had a wonderful trip up here. I um, sat beside a woman who, wonderful woman, who talked about acupuncture. <laughs> and um, she enlightened me on the nuances of the science. And I was having a cup of coffee. And uh, the conversation got so relaxed that she told me, you know, this coffee is not good for you. <laughs> <laughs> and that uh, it, it's, it's, it's dehydrating and that it stops the flow of certain energies uh, to the places where they ought to be. Uh, so after a little while, I had uh, to get rid of my coffee, and she offered me uh, a cup of warm water. So it was a good trip. <laughs> Sigrid picked me up, and we had a wonderful discussion from Hartford Airport over here. And um, she helped me see what it was I supposed to be doing tonight. Uh, and so I just want to thank her and uh, for the work that she's doing. Those of us who were involved in the precipitating events in 1979 were children of the 60s. We were organizers. We were freedom fighters. We were those dedicated to justice <laughs> and equality. We struggled for peace over against war. We went into the communities and into the factories and into the fields to help organize ordinary people so that they could be given expression to their own voices and their own aspirations. So in 1979, we were organizing textile workers. Uh, Many, if not most, in the factories were our white brothers and sisters. And we were <coughs> uniting them with uh, black workers. But not only that, we were bringing together uh, the workers of our state uh, and bending them into the tradition of the civil rights and the black power movements. It was in this context that the Ku Klux Klan openly opposed our work. And I'm going to make sense of why I'm saying this in a little bit. Without going into detail, we <laughs> felt the need to organize a conference to bring together all of the people and talk about racism and its history and how it manifested itself in the course of our work. Uh, we decided that we were going to march to the conference instead of just drive up to a conference. So we uh, picked a neighborhood where many black workers lived. And we said, we'll start here and we will walk over to the conference and then we will get involved in that discussion. I applied for a parade permit from our city some two weeks beforehand and uh, they hesitated on and did not immediately give me a parade permit. Uh, it was a strange discussion. When I called often, they would say that the people handling this are not in town. And it occurred to me, what does it mean when the police are not in town? <laughs> uh, and so it was a couple of days before this event was to occur. We had so much publicity on it and had no parade permit. And so we finally got that parade permit. But what we did not know, and what you heard in this film, was that the police had already given the parade permit to members of the Ku Klux Klan who were on their payroll. And they had, uh, and so when we started to march, the police fully knew that the Klan and Nazis were coming. They knew fully that they were armed with weapons in their vehicles and consolidated in their cars. And they knew that they planned to attack the march. Incredibly, uh, the police chose not to come to the starting point of the march at the agreed upon time. 
and instead they sent their tactical squad to early lunch. The results were horrifying. When the group came in and shouted the laws, people at a lodge shouted back, and then they pulled out their guns and opened fire on a largely unorganized or unarmed group of people. William Bill Sampson, a European white organizer, in the largest dinner producing factor in the world, shot through the heart. Cesar Cosset, a Latino brother who organized chicken workers and Duke University non-academic workers, shot through the heart. Michael Nathan, who came down because he wanted to make sure that the elderly and the weak were cared for as they marched. And so he was our first aid doctor. And as he went to attend to one of the men who shot, he himself was shot in the face. Jim Waller, the president of the union at Hall River, shot in the back. Sandy Smith, a beautiful young black lady that I call my sister. Her mother brought her from South Carolina and left her with us. And it was my sad duty, me and my wife, to call uh, her mother and tell her that her daughter, who aspired to be a nurse, but decided that we were going to take some time and do this organizing work, had been shot in the middle of the head as she was trying to get little children out of harm's way. Uh, nine other people <laughs> who were demonstrated were wounded. And uh, this poor African-American neighborhood with little children playing in the yard, and I didn't know this at the time, but there was a couple inside of the community center preparing for their wedding. When all of this broke loose, um, that neighborhood was terrorized. The city was shocked. And the media developed a presentation of this story, and it went something like this. I'm having a hard time seeing my, no, my sight is not what it used to be. The light's not too good up here. <laughs> so I'm going to go on automatic power for a moment. Uh, their presentation was that this had nothing to do with Greensboro, that this was about two extremist groups, one extreme left uh, communists, and the other one extreme right, Klan and Nazis. And they happened to have chosen Greensboro because they wanted to fight with each other. And the average citizen would not have known and did not know until some 15 years later that this was even connected to organizing textile workers. And I say this because I, 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 I have a sense of the media, but I was not as convinced as I am now of the capacity at that time to totally present another picture and sell it to the community. Thank God for social media. There were three trials. Uh, the first was a criminal trial brought by the state of North Carolina. And all the Klan and Nazis were acquitted. The second was a civil rights criminal trial. <coughs> brought by the federal government. And again, all the Klan and Nazis were acquitted. And by the way, both of these juries were all white jurors. And there was a third trial. And that was a civil trial. And out of that trial, one person, uh, well, let me say that for the first time in the history of the nation, as far as I know, Klan members, Nazis and, um, Greens and police officers were found jointly liable for wrongful death. And that was because of the persistent and hard work of the Greensboro Justice Fund. It laid the foundation and gave us a little hope to continue. This uh, trial, uh, 
lasted five months. And let me just say, all of the trials average five months. And if you would use your imagination, and if we think of our legal process as an adversarial process, it's not built around um, restorative justice. Uh, you hire somebody to make me look bad, and I hire somebody to make you look bad. And, uh, and so we come out of that not with some way of understanding the deeper truths of what gave life to this, not understanding what drove the people to do what they did, but we come out with some kind of verdict that actually leave people still split asunder. And that's what we were dealing with. And now I just ask you to imagine a 15 months of litigation over a five year period. And imagine how many stories were told, how many articles were printed, how many, how much confusion was created. And I want to just ask how much demonization has to be done to transform people into subhuman beings such that their lives are not appreciated and you can stop them like roaches. How much fear has to be injected to cause people to close their hearts and walk away as if nothing significant happened? How much confusion has to be generated so that people find it difficult to know in a depthful way right from wrong? How deep does the appeal have to be uh, to the vast historically stored up reservoir of racism and othering other people and the fanatic anti-communism to convince people that what you just saw with your eyes, that what you just looked at, you really didn't see that. Something else happened. And uh, all of what I have described was concentrated in Greensboro for about a five year period. It was like a steady rain dripping these elements that I've just put before you down on the ground. And then you have to see them soaking into the soil of that city and gradually getting into the groundwater. And we were all drinking that water and couldn't figure out why we couldn't get along. That we had brought all of this to, in, into play in our normal lives. And uh, that is the context, the reality that called forth and necessitated some kind of way to address this problem. Uh, by the late 90s, it was clear that we needed to think of some way to devise some mechanism to uh, learn how uh, the falsehoods and the deception and the fear and the violence could be engage in a way that it would give rise to a truth, a clarity, a love, a restorative justice, and a healing that could leave our community in a better position. Uh, the story about uh, this truth process takes a little <laughs> winding roads, but I want to share one with you. In 1999, the Justice Fund, together with the beloved Community Center, um, had the 20th anniversary of the tragic shootings. And a wonderful lady in, at Princeton, whose name is escaping me right now, Emily. Emily Mann, wrote a powerful play called Greensboro A Record. And a brave woman at the University of North Carolina in Greensboro brought that play to Greensboro. And every night, the play was packed up. And uh, a student uh, told us that his father was on the jury that voted to acquit. And he struggled with his father. He said, Dad, I want you to come to, to this play because I think you'll see something different. And his daddy came to the play. And when his daddy left, 
He said, if I had known what I know now, if I had been able to see this, I never would have voted to acquit the Klan and the Nazis. And so it was the arts, the, the, the medium of play and music that did something that prose rhetoric was not able to do. It touched the hearts of people, and we got to thinking, how can we help our city? How can we help more people see what this man saw? Uh, because without that, we would be playing the same song in the 20th verse. It just goes over and over again. And we discussed a number of things. Uh, our challenge was to get a buy-in from a sufficient number of part of the population so that something could work. By the end of 2001, we had settled on trying a truth and community reconciliation process. Now, we didn't know anything about how to do it, but let me just encourage you, you don't have to know how to do things. You have to be willing to find out how to do it. And then you have to step out and try to get something new done, because otherwise we'll just be going in the same circle. Uh, we wrote a declaration, and the Declaration of Intent said that we want to help our city be whole. We want to help our city be healed, but we're not, we want to do it based on understanding the forces that were actually at work, to understand the truth that gave rise to this. Uh, on the one hand, you can dismiss it as the extreme right and extreme left, but that almost is irrelevant. People were working for justice in the meals with black people and with white people, bringing people together. And so we said, that's what we want to do. And we got about 35 people to sign that declaration, a former mayor, uh, a number of clergy leaders, a number of uh, people on the city council. And incidentally, they were all black. And uh, we set up a process to get it. This was initiated by the people who have vested interest in this. And by the way, that's where all truth commissions come from. Uh, and so you can't trust what they're going to do. And so we had to put together a process that was so transparent, that was so clear, that it could be accepted. And so the selection committee uh, identified 17 groups, 17 niches, uh, and we wanted somebody from each one of those groups or niches <laughs> such that anyone in Greensboro would likely have someone on that selection committee with whom they could identify. Uh, the sons and daughters of the Confederacy were invited to be a part of it. The Chamber of Commerce invited to be a part of it. The Police Department invited to be a part of it. The NAACP invited to be a part of it. The Muslim community are invited to be a part of it. There were three or four different groups of Muslims and we worked with them and they came together and selected a person. The Jewish community, the Christian community, the Catholic community, the Republican Party, the Democratic Party were all represented on that. And they chose seven commissioners. And this commission worked hard for two years. And they worked under very strained conditions in order to pull together this information. <clears throat> they went out and sent people out into neighborhoods. Uh, they had public hearings. Uh, they put out weekly information and some five or six hundred people got involved in sharing their story. And I want you to know how meaningful it was. I was a little uh, not surprised, but gratified that there were people from Morningside community, the community where this took place, who said that we were children then. And on Monday morning, they sent us back to school. And nobody came to talk to us. And so we've been carrying this all these years, and we just thank God that we had somebody to talk to about this. And that, of course, included us. We had no one to talk to. The Klan and, 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 the, and the position that was taken was that nobody is going to come to this. The city of Greensboro voted publicly to oppose it. But I am pleased to report to you tonight that
Japan and Nazi members came back. The old judge who presided over the case came back. The lawyers came back. The members of the community came back. And so in spite of the lack of state power and state sanction, the moral authority of this work, organized through churches and through neighborhood groups and through all of these groups that I've talked about, created an energy field such that something was touched inside of people that wanted to know a little bit more about what is right and how to do it. And so they all came. And the commission put together a marvelous 529-page report. And um, in, in, in June of, in May of 2006, they issued that report. Um, let me say this. The racism, the othering under whatever name, uh, my own view, is that we live in a culture that's constructed along the lines of making someone up. Our identity is inscribed in some group. And when we don't have that, we're threatened uh, because we've not expanded the boundaries of humanity to include all. And so we live inside uh, of these groups. Um, and. Um, what we tried to do was to break that down and begin to raise that we have so much in common and that we owe it to each other. Um, and so we were able to put forward the view that the same thing that happened in Greensboro, and Greensboro was not unique, perhaps only in the magnitude and the concentration at a particular moment, but the whole history of our nation is one of absorbing this slowly and gradually and over a long period of time. You can't take 244 years of chattel slavery and say, oops, we made a mistake, and then go on with another 100 years of um, kind of false integration and Jim Crowism and so forth. All of that is there. And we have to learn to deal with it. Our first inclination is to fight. And I think that's part of the explanation for why we have so many wars. And before we can finish one war, we're into another. Uh, and so we came believing that our community might just be an experiment that could not only help Greensboro, but could help the nation. And let me just conclude by saying some words about what happened since 2006. Uh, I, I want to lift up for you tonight that truth processes are not cheap, uh, instant things, that you just do a little something and everything works out all right. There's too much there. We have to work with it over time. So I want you to know that. Um, we've not adequately reconcile Greensboro to our history. That's an ongoing process. <coughs> and in our little brochure, we said that we believe that the city is now at a tipping point. And that is that because we have persisted, because we've carried out numerous justice struggles, not just around 79, but around education, around what is called Amendment 1, in which a law was being passed that would permit people from loving and marrying each other. For the first time, we were ever able to bring together African-American ministers who were expected to oppose this. And when we came together, uh, one minister said, I'm not touching that with a 10-foot pole. And uh, I was in a funeral line. I thank God for this popular sister. It was a long line. <laughs> so we were standing there, and I finally asked him, what is the that that you would not touch with a 10-foot pole? And he stuttered on that question. I said, Reverend, don't you know you're talking about the humanity of somebody? And why is it that you have an objection to people who love each other and want to give expression to that in some kind of permanent bond? Uh, and we continued to talk. We walked by the casket, and then we walked on out. 
And I told him, I'm going to come and wrestle with you. One of us is going to leave there like Jacob, look. Uh, <laughs> but we've got to deal with this. He was open to it in part because he had also dealt with the truth process. And if you were willing to sit down with Klan and Nazis, why aren't you willing to sit down and hear this thing? And um, he finally conceded that uh, I'm going to join this. And we said, well, you got to tell somebody, like your congregation. <laughs> Better than that, you, we need to put an ad in the newspaper. <laughs> and then a group said, we'll give you the money for the ad. And uh, we discussed it and said, we don't want you to give that all of these churches, you ought to give $300, to every one of you. And then put your picture in the paper and get it published all over the town so somebody will know that some black preacher somewhere stood up for what was right and what was just. That came out of this process. So the process is not restricted to 79. It begins to cultivate an attitude of new possibilities. And that's what we're most proud of. But the most intransigent, stubborn part of our culture is our police department. It never joined. It never became a part of it. I got a phone call a minute ago from a person named Captain Chip. He was the chief of staff of the Greensboro Police Department in 1970, and uh, during the time that we were having this truth process, uh, and the chief left, and he was pulled out of the project. But he was a man with character. He was there long enough to see the possibilities. Dr. Vincent Harding, who wrote part of Dr. King's 1967 uh, speech, uh, Breaking the Silence, at Riverside Church, was sitting there because of the truth process and looked at this man and said, you need to be a part of this. And he became a part of it. And he's been standing in that department ever since. And let me just update you on where we are, then I want to close and perhaps receive some questions. Uh, there was a young group in the city called the Latin Kings. Uh, they were identified as a gang. And we struggled that we've got to stop making them uh, uh, look like they have no possibilities except what somebody who's making money is saying that they are doing. And so we wanted to put forward a paradigm shift proposal. We said that we ought to begin to look at these young people not as a problem, but as a resource for justice making, for community building. And these young people came together and pulled together five different gangs from around the city in the spirit of the truth and reconciliation process. The only reason why they trusted us is because they knew what we had done with the truth process. And so that's the, the residual uh, meaning of some of this. And so they worked out a peace treaty. I'm, I'm, I'm very sad to say that the police beat on them so hard, went on their jobs, got them fired. So we haven't dealt with that problem adequately yet. And these young people are now in court on racketeering charges. Uh, my heart bleeds for them. But this is the good news. Part of the police department stood up against what the police was doing and said, we aren't going to be a part of entrapping these young people. We're just not going to do it. And they fired uh, a young Latino officer. And he said that if I'm fired, I'm fired. And then a black officer stood with this officer. And then the captain stood with all of them, and they fired a 23-year captain who was a veteran. But it's the worst mistake they ever made. They lose this man. And now he has organized, there are now 50 suits against the city of Greensboro, largely built by Captain Church. And we believe that we're at a tipping point now. I had a meeting with the mayor. He said, I don't know what I'm going to do. I said, well, we have a few ideas. <laughs> you know, y'all never joined the truth process. But now you're offering thousands of dollars to buy people's silence. And what we are suggesting to you, that that's not the way. We are inviting you to come now and sit around a new table because we've got some unfinished business. This is not something that you can do immediately. And I've got a feeling, as a matter of fact, I come believing tonight
tonight that this tipping point is that we're just about there and what was missing was the city of Greensboro itself. Now the leader of the international uh, transition process that helped guide us in this process said that the Greensboro process may have been the most successful non-governmental process that existed in the world that he knew of and he was working with all of them. But it still didn't realize its full objective. And so what we believe is that we are now beginning to transition into a new era in which social justice, racial justice, is the main obstacle to realizing the beautiful possibilities that's ours as a people. We believe that education is hooked right to that, but the road to education has to go through some process that allow us to see each other as brothers and sisters and not as enemies. It has to go through an economic process that holds the possibility for some life and living and jobs for everybody. We don't believe that there's going to be a new train full of jobs coming through town. We have to invent something new on the ground and all of that grows out of a healing process that opens up a beautiful possibility for what we can do. So beloved, um, I just want to say to you tonight that I am happy and I'm honored and I'm encouraged. Uh, not so much because we can bring you a glowing report of a finished product, but we are on the road and we're on the way. And I want to join with Bishop Tutu tonight by saying that unless we find a way to engage our yesterdays, we don't have a tomorrow because our tomorrow will be our yesterday. It will just be much worse. But my hope is, and my belief is, that a price has been paid, work has been done, and the Greensboro Project, we think, is a small spark, maybe a little flame. But somebody up in Maine saw it and say, we want to try it. Somebody in Boston saw it and say, we want to go back to the 1973 uh, bus uh, school program. Somebody in Detroit saw it. Say, we want to go back to the 1967 uh, revolt there that was largely around housing and some other issues. Somebody in Minnesota saw it and say that we want to get some black and Native American people together around the environmental abuses. Somebody in Mississippi saw it and say, we want to rework this so there is a budding little movement beginning to happen. And so I just want to thank God I want to thank you for this program tonight, and I want to encourage you that you have to believe in the possibilities that are not yet there. If we try to measure it by something that we've already done, it probably won't work because we have to do a new thing. And I know that you're capable of doing it. We as a nation are capable of the process of living into the fullness of our human potential and therefore becoming a gift to one another. And that's what diversity means at the end of the day. I've never seen a flower garden with the flowers arguing with each other. Uh, they all look good. And when they are together, one magnifies the beauty of the other. And so we ought to learn something from the flower garden as we go forward. Thank you. God bless you. Around here, the TRC process was a way to help people on them and to give them an avenue that was non-threatening in the sense of um, just some evil people getting back at you. But I think I hear in your question, if everyone was open to introspection and looking at themselves as we look at each other and sharing our best understanding of our own flaws and faults, and being open to hearing and receiving that from others, we wouldn't need a TRC process. But unfortunately, we have a long human history where that rarely happens on uh, the macro level. There are many small instances of that. And so um, I have a kind of yes and no answer to your question 
because I can't quite get out of the context that we're in. Uh, and so I have to advocate for that we really need some kind of process to assist us in being uh, reconciled to each other based on a deep truth. The context is really important and I just wanted to describe, well one thing is it took the Truth Commission it got started 25 years after the incident, so it was really a long period of time. Um, but when the Klan and Nazi caravan drove up to where we were assembling to march, they, the first thing they did was start cursing at us. And, and I remember them saying, hearing them saying, um, niggers, Kikes, nigger lovers, and I remember thinking to myself, what are, you, what are you talking about? You know, you don't know, I don't know you, and you don't know me. And then, I mean, that was before they opened fire. And then, I mean, when they opened fire and killed five of our very dear friends, I mean, it was unbelievable. How could they do that? They don't even know who we are. They don't know, we don't know them. They don't know us. So to have that kind of response is the context of that kind of deep distance and dehumanization. And that's why, and the court system didn't resolve that. And so, but really, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, I really like what Nelson, how he said, it was very meaningful. It really helped us deal with reconciling with a lot, I feel like who I reconciled with were broad sectors of the Greensboro population who came to those events, who volunteered, who were part of it, who were, who, I mean, the black community, large, many of them understood what had happened because of their experience, but whites in Greensboro really just thought, well, these were crazy people who deserved it. I mean, they really did not understand what had gone on, and through the truth process, they did grapple with it. And they did, and I do think it was a beginning, and, and that's what Nelson tried to express. So maybe that is some description to help you kind of see how, how heavy the context was and how real that context was. They go to guns in their cars, go 50 miles in Greensboro, shout curse words out the window. And when people responded by saying things back <laughs> to them, they pulled out their guns and shot them. And the defense that the state presented or not that their lawyers presented was that they were merely trying to defend themselves. Um, I, I say that because I'm trying to give an answer to the question you asked. Beneath that is television pictures with people shooting people, and it had nothing to do with self defense. Um, they came there with intent, um, they had our pictures, and they purpose to hurt and kill some people. In the uh, civil trial, my understanding was that you had to be violating um, civil rights, the animals had to be yeah. civil rights. They, in the second trial, which is the federal criminal civil rights trial, um, the prosecutors, which were working for the Reagan government, chose a law that said that the reason that our people were shot was because of racism. <laughs> now, the Klan, Nazis, racism, one would think that even that would be fairly easy to do. But what the Klan said was that, no, we, first of all, we didn't do it. Second of all, if we did it, it was in self-defense. And third of all, if we didn't, if we didn't, if we did do it and it wasn't self-defense, then it was because of their politics, not because of their race. Now the interesting thing there was that the police were involved up to their ears in this. And Reagan's Justice Department could have chosen a different law 
it did not require that barrier, that animal, okay? But in order to use that particular law, they had to deal with the involvement of the police. And they chose not to do that because that was, that was too scary for them. I think another element in all of this stuff is that uh, it was very clear the police department organized, recruited, and led the Klan and Nazi coalition and caravan to carry out the murders. That became very clear during the course of the trial because it was very good uh, investigative reporters mostly because it didn't come out in the trials, it came out in the press. And the, uh, the speculation that I would offer, and it has to be speculation because we don't have a paper trail at this point, even after the Truth Commission, is that they really wanted to protect their boys from spilling more information about what actually happened, who was actually involved. Mm -hmm. Because the, the involvement was not only the Greensboro Police Department, but it must be known that there was a full-time undercover agent of the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms named Bernard Butkovich, who was in Nazi uniform that helped to pull together this United Racist Front, a group the likes of which had never existed in the United States before because the Klan would not touch the Nazis after World War II because the Klan was 100% American and the Nazis were enemies of the United States in World War II. Bernard Butkovich helped pull this thing together, full-time agent BATF. He was exonerated by an internal investigation that was never released. The <coughs> undercover Klan guy, Eddie Dawson, who was working with the police, had also had a long-standing, intimate relationship, it must be known, with the FBI, and was in direct contact with the FBI during the run-up to these murders. The FBI had 10,000 pages of documents on this whole thing, 1,000 pages of which was a report on what actually happened. We haven't been able to get that report yet. This is still an ongoing process. I would suggest to you that the lengthy history of racism in the United States has continued, and the Greensboro Massacre is one of many notable examples of it. It's relatively small on the scale of historic phenomena, actually. But they, they had to protect their boys because they had a lot in this thing, and they pulled out all the stops. I mean, the ways I couldn't get into the trial because I was not a member of the immediate family of any of those people who were killed. I was shot in the head, and I was physically prevented from getting into the trial. I was in a wheelchair at the time. So it was very clear that this was not an open proceeding. This was nothing like what anybody with any sense at all would call justice. This was a complete mockery of anything that anybody with any sense at all would call justice. So I'll just leave it at that. So much here was made that the University of Massachusetts is the most unionized, large institution in the state. In New England. In New England. <laughs> I want to give a shout out to that, first of all. Um, I think that uh, working people and poor people are under tremendous assault by, um, let me use a generic term, the forces of domination. Um, and I think that unions became a real target, uh, particularly public sector unions, uh, after the 2010 uh, election. And I think there's tremendous resistance to people coming together and working together to advocate for their own interests. I, I want to say this because after a while, uh, it just gets confusing. You know, union is natural to humanity. Uh, the Chamber of Commerce wants its union that um, the faith community, you join a church, you know, you become part of that union. Uh, when people look at each other and a certain sparkle flashes in the eye, people say, I want to be with you the rest of my life, they get a union. What in the world is wrong with working people coming together and forming a union for their own welfare? But somehow, the powers that be has helped a lot of people feel that there is something wrong with that. And some of the people are acting against their own best interests. And that's why this whole question of truth around many fronts in our country is so important. 
So I think the union movement is struggling. Uh, there are others here who may be more acquainted with it than I am. Um, I'm working with farm laborers in North Carolina. Uh, doing all right, but it's an uphill push. Well, anyway, just to say a sentence on that, um, it really did. We had, we were very involved in union organizing, and the, and all of the people who were killed were ranged from being leaders of the different union projects or strong supporters, and um, and it really set back the union movement in North Carolina, which had been really growing up until then. Um, and I think it's still, and then of course the economic shift where all the textile industry basically got shipped overseas or almost all of it. Um, so it's been really rough there. And, and um, there have been some creative things like Nelson has been, yeah, um, that he's been involved in. Speaking. One of the experiences in our city was, uh, was the Walmart of its day. It was called Kmart in the mid-90s. It was the big retail business. And they set up a shop in Greensboro. It was 35 football fields in size. It supplied hard goods to five states, uh, southern states, uh, connected to North Carolina. And they brought in uh, four or 500 young workers and they mistreated them. It was too hot in there. They didn't have any uh, vacation. Uh, and they were abused. So a lot of sexual improprieties were going on by the supervisor. And they saw some way to deal with that. And um, they eventually voted in a union. Uh, it was Unite. Uh, and they would negotiate with them for about 20 minutes and then break off the negotiation and come back in two weeks. Uh, it was all going nowhere as they were firing people. Well, it was this Greensboro community that had struggled through the Klan and the Nazis came together. And we actually stood with those workers. And they decided that they were going to um, block the aisle of the Kmart store and prevent commerce prevent them from selling anything. Well, I was pretty clear that the Greensboro police would love to crack some heads. And so um, they, uh, we struggled until about three in the morning one night not to do that, just because I was aware of that. But then I thought what they were talking about was exactly the thing to do. But we felt that a discipline needed to be there because if somebody reached up and touched something and fell, and the police touched them, and they jerked, and somebody fell, and it would be a whole riot in the store. And uh, so we struggled that the clergy of this city, if you don't think the workers right now are spiritually disciplined enough to do this, who might be? And gradually, we came to the view, we asked the workers, would you let us do what you said you would do we just want to stand in for you for a minute, not forever, just a monolith. And so we all went to jail. Uh, and that started a process so that every week after church, we would reform and have church out in front of the Super Kmart. Um, <laughs> wow. And the workers came, and so on with the King Day, we had busloads of people who were committing civil disobedience going to jail, teachers in the, in the school bus with children, lesson going on. And so in some sense, that whole experience uh, won the best first contract that ever existed in North Carolina. Um, because I think the question of unions is not fundamentally different from most other questions. Once you see and once you make a decision, you have to think of the creative tactics that are necessary in order to carry that through to the end. And it means the union uniting with the community itself. As a matter of fact, the union is part of the community. 
because the community is an inclusive category, that actually has been used around the nation. I've gone around and done trainings on this. So um, it's a positive within a negative. I think that that's one positive example in that city uh, that continued to foster the union movement. And I'm uh, a staff person here on campus. I work at the Labor Center, so it's that brother would like to talk to me afterward about where you can find out more about the labor movement. I'd be happy to do that. Um, and I really hate to ask a question that takes us off the topic of labor. Um, I understand the importance of pursuing truth. And I think I understand community reconciliation, the crafting together a new truth. But what I struggle to understand is individual reconciliation. You know, I hear, Paul, in your voice, passion for what happened and for the whole truth of what happened. And so my question is to all of you, out of the truth and reconciliation process, what has changed for you as individuals in terms of I, in terms of coming coming to church? I mean, I I find it unfathomable how you face the people who took away from you loved ones. For me, I don't feel reconciled with any of the Klansmen because, in my view, I didn't hear any of them really express remorse for the death of people that I loved and that I knew were, you know, human beings and, and who should still be with us today. Um, I don't feel any reconciliation with any of the big business interests in Greensboro at all because at least as far as I can see, the status quo continues in terms of labor, in terms of community, in terms of poverty. But the, what the Greensboro Truth and Reconciliation Commission did for me was it enabled us and the, all of us testify, it enabled us to say our piece of the truth and there was a whole auditorium like this listening to it. And there were commissioners who were listening to us intently and questioning us and researching. And they really struggled to put together a report that told a story that we had been trying to tell, that we had been in our own ways trying to tell from the very beginning. But it, because it was seven individuals from different walks of life who listened to all sides and who had independence and distance from us. That was scary, actually, to give them that <laughs> to a lot. You know, sorry, not for me, it was very scary. But they really struggled to tell, to put together, the, you know, a report that expressed this truth and that was heard and received and discussed by hundreds, maybe thousands of people in Greensboro. And that took a burden off of us to just be out there as survivors who have been ridiculed, dehumanized, and put down. All of a sudden there were other people who were hearing this and understanding, seeing us as human beings. And that, limited as it is, was incredibly healing for me. Uh, so. You're very right, very passionate about this, absolutely. I agree with you. Most everything Sally said, and most everything Nelson said, we've, we've had a remarkable degree of unity over these last 33 years. You know, November 3rd is the 33rd anniversary of the Greensboro Massacre, two days from now. It's still pretty amazing to me. And a lot of young people, you know, there's a few great years, you know, still don't say better than the younger people do. It goes fast, it goes real fast. <laughs> but the, uh, the whole idea of truth and reconciliation from the beginning, I was not that interested in reconciliation, frankly. Right? I was interested in getting the truth out. And I still think that the concept of reconciliation, if it's looked at honestly and truthfully, is very problematic. 
Because what exactly are you reconciling with? What does reconciliation even mean? Does reconciliation mean that you adapt to the situation, you allow for it, you reconcile yourself to it, accept it? Well, I, I've never had the intention, nor have I ever gotten anything, anywhere close to that view. I'm, I remain an unashamed revolutionary. I think this whole thing needs to be torn down and rebuilt into something decent for the vast majority of people of the world. And I still believe that, and I advocate that as much as I can. <coughs> I think that everything that happened in Greensboro simply reinforced that belief in me. So from a personal standpoint, that's where I'm at. I think it was a very good thing to get the truth out. I think it was a very fulfilling thing in a certain way to be able to talk to people who had been brainwashed for 25 years by the lies of the media about what happened. There was a wonderful report that one of the other widows wrote about the Greensboro Massacre. She, looked, she called it, she had a brilliant title for it. She called it a city of two tales. And she enumerated how there were two approaches to what happened. Different people, you know, the people in power presented the story of the two extremist groups fighting it out, whereas the facts were quite at odds with that. So there was a lot of things that came out, a lot of different things that came out that meant different things for different people. But I think that it's, it's really an ongoing historic fight and needs to continue. And I'm very glad to see such a patient and large audience tonight. So thank you for that. I think that human history is a long journey of different groups fighting killing each other. It has become normative and therefore it is uh, pretty much expected. The question I think that your question raises is, is there a greater human potential that holds the possibility of significantly reducing and possibly ultimately ending that piece of our human journey. And I've struggled on this a lot. And the issue of reconciliation is not to me, let me switch words for a while and try to forgive this, is not primarily about what somebody else does. It's about what I choose to do. And one way to think about it, if I had a bar right here, and on this side was the meanest, most gruesome uh, way a human being could be. That's and on the same bar, there is the possibility of generosity of love, of compassion, and that most of us are somewhere in between this. I choose to believe that there is much greater potentiality than is actualized. And the question then becomes, what do you do to assist that potentiality? My own conviction is you have to nurture that part. You have to sow to it if you want. I think that um, if you sow to the other one, it reinforces the pattern of human history. And therefore, my leader talks about wars and rumors of wars as a continual revolving phenomenon. I want to just suggest that I sat down with Roland Wayne Woods. You saw him in that picture. I don't know how many people he shot. Um, he shot some, I'm sure. But he was on his convalescent bed, and he asked um, the wife of the man that he liked to kill, Sidney Wallow, to come talk to him. She asked me to go with her. And I sat outside for a while to give him time to talk. Her son was with her, um, and they had to talk. And I came in, and what I saw 
was um, something of a half-repentant person who was saying um, that I really didn't want to go to Greensboro. I, I don't know whether I was buying that or not, but he said that the BATF agent told me that if I didn't go and if I didn't carry those guns, that they were going to take my command. I was shocked to hear that, that the BATF or the federal government was pushing him to go. Um, and he finally said that I uh, think God has forgiven me. There was a lot of God talking this. When people get in trouble, you, you get that. Uh, and, uh, and I don't say that disrespectfully. It's just the way we do. Um, but he finally said that I have not been able to forgive myself. What I did was wrong. This is a Nazi. So I had a choice to make. Uh, my choice was, you, you scout her out and kick you in the knee right here. You know, that's one choice. But I said to, to Woods, listen, you um, did what you did, and you can't make that go away. I don't know how long you have, but you have a choice. And your choice is to try to come to terms with that and live the best life you can. So I want you to accept your own forgiveness and I offer you mine. Because I don't need him to be a Nazi for the rest of his life. If there is the slightest possibility that he might be able to grow, then I want to help that to happen. And I think that in some sense, we don't need to prostrate ourselves and say, you can kick me, you can do anything you want to do. We take adequate caution, but I think we need to rethink how we humans, you know, can turn a page, if you please, in such a way that it opens up something different and something new. But it can't happen, in my estimation, unless one is convicted of the potentiality. The actuality is what you're doing. Nobody is reducible just to their actuality. And so I want to argue for the potentiality of individuals and of humankind together. And I choose to sow to that possibility. This is really interesting because I who here, how many saw the film, Greensburg Closer to the Truth? Um, I was not there when this man, Nelson, was talking about Wayne Woods, um, made his statement to the public or to Sidney and Nelson in private. I rejected it immediately when I was called by the, by the media. But watching him again, just that very night, or when we saw the film the other night, um, I realized a little piece of the answer to the question. I realized that though he was still lying through his teeth, even as he made all this, these excuses for why he was there and everything, um, I mean, it was just, it was as crazy as ever. You know, in many ways. When he said, I am truly sorry, for the first time ever, it occurred to me that I understood that he truly was sorry, even though he's been dead now for five years or so. That he really was sorry, with all his lies and everything. And the second piece was that I could accept that. And I never had before. I had taken him as the guy on this end of the bar, you know, of, of Nelson's bar. And I, I literally, um, it had happened to me years previously, he and his girlfriend had gotten in uh, an accident on their motorcycle. And they were in the emergency room where I was a resident, and I left because I was afraid of what I would do. Um, if I was made to care for his girlfriend. <laughs> Elliot remembers my coming home that night and saying, <laughs> I just couldn't stay there anymore. 
Um, so I think, you know, maybe I'm just old, <laughs> but I think I understand that despite the lies, there is forgiveness. And there is the hope there that I, I couldn't express it as well as Nelson can, that there may be hope for all of us. But that doesn't mean that they can get, get away with that, not examining their own shit. Okay, the forgiveness is not there unless we all seek some truth together. Um, because there are victims and there are perpetrators. And that should never be left in the dust of reconciliation. Um, if that's helpful. That there's a correlation between economic hardship and the rise of racism. And you were raising the question of, does that have to be, and how might it not be? Okay. You raised it, of course. <laughs> Appreciate that. Uh, I, first of all, I don't accept that it has to be. Um, I accept that it's this ordinary and it tends to be because we carry within ourselves a certain piece of survival and in some people's mind it's me or you you know uh, it gets down to that i think the premise that there has to be economic hardship is one that i don't accept um, i don't think that we have a world of insufficiency <coughs> I think that we have structures and systems that, um, based on some way of valuing people, uh, set up in such a way that some people um, have less than they need, but other people wallow in the obscenity of too much. Um, the great struggle is how do we engage that? And I think that there would have to be a concurrent that as we struggle for a change in the social structures, we have to also struggle for a change in the ethics. Uh, I think they have to come together. In my tradition, there's a story. Um, and some of you will recognize it. Um, it's the story of the man who came from heaven. Um, and if you don't recognize it, it's all right. Um, but the idea was that the people were in need, and then the resources showed up in the form of bread. And the people, people think the miracle was that the bread showed up. Actually, I think the miracle was the instruction on how to distribute. Uh, and what the word said uh, in this particular story is those who need little take little, and those who need much take much. So if you got a 30 pound child who needs something, they don't need as much as uh, a 250 pound man uh, or woman. Uh, and by definition, if there's something called too little, there has to be something called too much. Uh, I think the great evil of our society is that we have strayed so far away from that. And by the way, in between too little and too much is a place called enough. And we have to deal with enough. We need a structure that helps us get to that place. And we have to have the ethics to hold that structure in place. Because if you put it in place and people are still devaluing, belittling, and looking down on other people, they will actually think they don't deserve enough. And I can have too much. I know this is kind of abstract, but I'm, I'm trying to say that I think it's a difficult challenge. It actually is part of the spirit of truth and healing and reconciliation. But I think we have to work with them concurrently, and I don't think there's an easy solution. 
I've avoided talking about the particular mode of or kind of, of social structures that we need. I do have my thoughts on that, but that's a discussion for another time. We have to come. We have to come. But they only come when the people themselves build up to a point and claim and own their own power so that you come or you're no longer our man, you're no longer our counsel. And we think that we have approached that. That's what I'm calling the tipping point, to transition our city into a new era. It's not obvious to most people. Uh, water heating up in a pot uh, is not obvious to a lot of people. Keep the flame down. And after a while, thank God for after a while, uh, you begin to see the signs that is the fruit of persistence. And I think that in this culture where we want to just push a button and this happen and that happen, this is a long struggle to change something deeply <coughs> embedded in our culture and in our way of thinking. And uh, I think a lot of different processes are going to be necessary to get that done.